you guys don't know, my name is Pastor Dustin. I'm the student pastor here. Where's my, any OSC youth in the house? Okay, a few of you, a few of you. They're all at the 11 o'clock service. You guys know that. <laughs> um, so I love just sharing a little bit about myself. If you guys don't know, I am an Apple guy. So like I have like an, I have an iPad, I have an iPhone, I have an Apple Watch. I, I'm an Apple guy. It's this. I haven't always been, though. I haven't always been. Like, I've actually switched back and forth quite a bit. Like, I had an iPhone. I kind of started off in high school with an iPhone. And then uh, after I graduated, switched to Android. And then after that, switched back to iPhone. And then switched to Android again. And then in 2020, when, so like in 2020, when I got hired on here, like I had an Android. I had a Dell laptop. And... Uh, I was the only one in the office with a Dell laptop and an Android and nothing. They're like, oh, just airdrop that to me. And I'm like, I can't airdrop that. <laughs> and so I, so I got a Mac and I got, a, uh, I got an iPhone. See, me and Ashley actually switched. She had an iPhone and so she gave me her iPhone. So got back into the Apple ecosystem. Um, because you, know you know how they do that. And so I can, I can confidently put the argument to rest. I've had both for many years, and I can tell you that they're both great phones. They're both great phones. They both have their own uh, like things about them that make them really great. iPhone's better, but they're both really great phones. <laughs> They're awesome phones. They have cameras that are really good. Their own operating systems. iPhone's better, but they're still really good <laughs> phones. <laughs> and so I don't know if you guys have ever like switched from iPhone to Android, but uh, you have a tendency, or Android back, even Android to iPhone, you'll, you have a tendency to like lose pictures and stuff, right? Like you lose your data. They don't talk to each other very well. And so I have uh, pictures and videos all over the place online. Like I have some on my iCloud. I have some on my iCloud that aren't on my phone. I have some on Google Photos. I have some on Google Drive. When I was switching, I wanted to make sure that I kept my photos, so I, I put them on a Google Drive. Like they're all over the place. And I have to pay, like specifically for Google Photos, I have to pay $1 a month for extra storage for pictures that I have on there, even though I'm all Apple now. So the other day, I was like, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm tired of paying this $1 a month. You know what I mean? Like, money, like, times are tight right now. Like, I'm not sp spending a dollar on Google Photos. So I start going through my Google Photos and just, like, deleting all the unnecessary pictures and stuff like that and, and then transferring all the ones that I want to keep. And so here's the thing. As I switched to iPhone and, and Apple again in 2020, my son was born in 2019. So I have no pictures, no videos of my son when he was a newborn on my phone at all. And so I'm going on Google Photos and guess what happens? I land on 2019 pictures and videos of my son Emerson when he was first born. How many of you guys like, you know, like when you start looking through pictures and videos and you just like get in your feelings a little bit? You guys, you know what I'm talking about. What, the, girl, the women in here are like, I know what you're talking about. So I look at old pictures and you're like, oh my goodness, they're so small. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> but like, so I'm looking through these, I'm getting all in my feelings. And then like, this is the, watch this video. This is, I have a video of Emerson when he was first born. Check out this video. <laughs> look at that. The cuteness overload. <laughs> That's all he does, is he just stares and smacks and licks his lips. It's the cutest, the cutest. So, I re I'll never forget like the time that uh, like Emerson was born, right, my son. I'll never forget like holding them in my hands for the first time, you know, and, and, and just even, like, you guys know this if you have children, like, all of, like, the, the baby smells, you know, um, that all the, uh, that how soft they feel, 
Like they're so soft. Like they, there's no calluses yet. And they can't, you know, like my son's feet are rough now. He's only three. <laughs> um, and so uh, like there, it was just like the most precious moments, right? Like just staring down at him, him just looking back at me and just making those smacking noises and licking his lips, which I found out actually just meant he wanted his mom, but <laughs> it was still amazing. I remember holding him for the first time and like, it's almost like everything else faded away, you know? And, and it was just me and him and I was looking down at him and he was looking up at me. And I just remember really being in my feelings and, and just literally just wanting to cry because he was so amazing and, and seemingly perfect when he was first born, just holding him. And so I wanna do something with you guys this morning. Uh, I want everyone in here to close your eyes. Close your eyes. We're not, that, we're not a weird church, I promise. We're not gonna do anything weird. Close your eyes, just right now. Well, everyone in here, just close your eyes. And I want you to think about your most fondest memory, like the best memory you have. Like really spend some time, go there. Like what were the, what were the things that you felt the smells maybe bring, there's a specific smell that takes you back there. You know exactly how it smelt in that memory. Maybe it was just visual. Maybe it was, you know, your child's birth. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was some kind of special occasion or some kind of experience that you got. Maybe, maybe it was just the perfect day, that just a normal random day that just ended up perfect. Like really just go back there. Feel the feelings that you felt in that moment. The, the, the joy that maybe you felt. The peace that maybe you felt. Just the emotions tied to that memory. Happiness, peace, calm. Maybe it was a vacation. You're there? Okay, now I want everyone to open their eyes and look at me. God is infinitely better than anything you just pictured. <laughs> he is infinitely greater than anything on this earth. That, he, he, that, that, uh, that Psalms 50 verse 2 says that out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. He is the perfection of beauty. So whatever even beauty you pictured, God is the perfection of it. That God is the peace that, you've, that, that you're longing for. God is the joy that whatever joy and peace that you felt in that memory, in that time, God can infinitely give you more peace and more joy than anything you've pictured. He's that amazing. He's that great. Watch what Psalm 146 says. It says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness can fathom. Like you can't even fathom, you can't even picture or imagine how great God is. That's how great he is. That's how amazing he is. That's how majestic he is. That's how beautiful he is. You can't even picture it. You can't even fathom it. And I get it, right? Like, we can't fathom the greatness of God, but we can fathom the greatness of man. We can put our hands on that. We can picture that, like the things that are tangible, the things that we can feel, smell, see, are all things that we can sense and know kind of greatness of. And so we have a tendency to focus on the great things that are tangible of this earth that is right in front of us. And we don't look past the tangible of God's greatness of the things that aren't of this world. And so we have to be careful because if we don't look past the tangible, we will actually get tangled in the tangible. That will put things in our lives in positions that they're never meant to be in. That we will hold like dear to things that we were never meant to hold dear to, that things will be 
uh, in positions in our lives that will inevitably let us down because only God is designed with his infinite greatness to be first in our lives. And when we put things, other things first in our lives, they will let us down. Some of you are depressed because of it. Some of you are in a tough season because you've put things first in your life that were never designed to be there. Watch what 1 John says, 1 John 5, 21. It says, dear brothers, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. This concept of idolatry is all throughout scripture, all throughout the Bible. If you guys, you know, haven't been in church that long and you don't know what this term idol is, is back in the day, back in Jesus' day, they, that they had a bunch of like different religions and stuff. And so they would have idols that they would worship to other gods. And uh, though our idols today may not look like statues of Greek gods and goddesses, they look a little bit different. They look more like social media. They look more like our family, our careers, our money, our acceptance. And so there are, you know, restaurants and theaters and stadiums that, that, are actually temples that people are worshiping in that we just don't even realize. They may not look like temples, but they are because we are created to worship. Our creative purpose, beings, are created to worship, and we have a tendency to worship the created things instead of the creator. That we have a tendency like to, that, that, to, to put things first in God's place when we are actually meant to just enjoy and steward the things that are created and worship the creator. And I know that you might be in here and you're like, like God gave me that child God gave me that spouse. So why can't, like it's a, they're a gift from God. God gave me that career. Why can't that work? Like, why can't, uh, why can't I put that first in my life? And I want you to know that it's because God wants what's best for you. He just knows it's him. He is what is best for you. He is the dream that you have. He is the promotion you're longing for. He is the vacation that you desire. He is what you are seeking. Whatever you're seeking, can I tell you that it is met by God. God is the only answer to the gap that's in our lives. And we, we feel it with careers. We feel it with family. We feel it with all these other things that the world tells us that needs to be first, but they weren't ever designed to be so. And so the important question is this, who or what are you worshiping? Because you're always worshiping. Who or what are you worshiping? Watch what 1 Corinthians says. It says, therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies amongst themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Idolatry, that's what idolatry is. It's putting things in positions in our lives that were never meant to be there. Martin Luther, the founder of kind of the Protestant Reformation, he's, he talks about how the first commandment, you guys know the 10 commandments, right? The first commandment, thou shalt not have any other God beside me. Like, most of us are like, well, that's an easy one. Cool, God is my God, check. But when you view it through the concept of idols, it is actually one of the hardest ones to keep. That do you have other gods in your life before or above God? That, that, that Martin Luther actually talks about how, how it, it is first because it's the foundation that if you get the first one right, you'll actually get all the other commandments right. And if, you, and if you are finding yourself failing at the other commandments, that it's likely because you have already broken the first commandment. It's the foundation. John Calvin, he puts it this way. He says, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. It's the factory of it. It's the source of all of our sin. 
It's the source of everything that we do wrong and that we are factories, like just producing more and more idols every single day. We're all guilty of it because it's the root of all sin and we all fall short. We're all sinful and guilty of this concept of putting other things before God. You know, everyone knows the story of the feeding of the 5,000, right? Like, you guys know that story? If you guys don't know the story, it seems like no one raised their hand. So I'll tell you guys about (laughs) the feeding of the 5,000. So the the way that the story goes is Jesus just finds out that one of his closest, the people closest in his life, uh, John, just got beheaded. And really, like, beheaded by, like, the command of a little girl. And so he, like, goes and gets away and tries to get secluded by himself just to mourn and to, you know, and to grieve. And so he's like ministering to these people, and then he goes to get away, and the scriptures say that the the crowd actually followed him. And so when he realizes that the crowd followed him, it says that the scriptures say that he saw the people and he had compassion for them, for they're like sheep without a shepherd, Um, which is a whole, I think, message in itself of grieving and still seeing people with compassion. But but he, he sees these people, and he just starts ministering to them, being there for them, teaching them. And it says, the scriptures say that it, like, it grew late, and so the, the disciples, they go up to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, uh, can we kind of wrap this up? Like, we're, we're a little hungry here. <laughs> starting, the, the disciples, they're starting to get hangry a little bit. And, uh, and so Jesus is like, I mean, the disciples are like, you know, Everyone else is probably getting hungry too. And Jesus is like, no, we're not going to stop this. We're not going to stop what's happening. We're actually going to feed them. And the disciples are like, but we've only got five loaves and two fish. And so Jesus is like, give it to me. And so he prays a blessing over it, gives it back to his disciples. And the disciples go and they hand it to everyone else. And watch what it says in Matthew 14. And it says this. And it says in Matthew 14, verse 20, it says, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. That they were more than they started with, right? That there were leftovers of bread and fish. How many of you guys love some good bread and fish leftovers? I think I would pass on it the next day. (laughs) Like, oh, bread, fish, thanks. No, I'm good. But it says that they were all satisfied, they were all, they were satisfied. Every single person who was hungry was satisfied. You see, many people know the feeding of the 5,000. They just don't know, a lot of, less people know that just one chapter later, Jesus does it again. He feeds 4,000 people. And so a similar kind of situation happens. They're in a desolate place and Jesus is ministering. But this time it says that they hadn't like eaten in three days. And it it literally, the scriptures literally say that Jesus is worried that if they go and find food, that they're actually going to faint. Like that's how, that's how hungry he perceived that they were, or he knew that they were. And so the disciples are like, Jesus, what are we going to do? Give me the loaves, give me the bread. So they had seven loaves this time and just a few small fish. Does the same thing, they pass it out. And one chapter later, Matthew 15, it says this, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of pieces left over. They were all satisfied. Every single person who came and were hungry were met with food. Why am I telling you this? Why is this story twice in the Bible? Is it for us to know that Jesus can multiply bread and fish? Sure, maybe. Is it for us to know that, that the disciples are kind of dumb? <laughs> and, you know, they forgot what Jesus did in one chapter and then had to go to Jesus again in another chapter? For sure. Is it just for us to know that people who lack food, God can meet them? Absolutely. But I think the meaning goes a little bit deeper. See, I think the meaning of all this, outside of all those other things, is that when people are hungry, Jesus will feed them. And I'm not talking about physical hunger. 
I'm talking about a spiritual hunger. People who have a hunger for Jesus, a desire to see Jesus in their lives, move in their lives. Jesus will always feed them. Jesus will always meet them where they are at and, 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 and feed them until they are satisfied. You want more Jesus? He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. You know, I have to brag about OSC Youth and what God is doing in OSC Youth a little bit. Just last week, we came out of Camp Youth. And I remember, like, kind of that last night. It was just amazing. Like, God really moved the first night. It was wild. God moved the second night. And then that third night, it was, I mean, it, was, it just exceeded all of our expectations. You know what I mean? Like, just exceeded our expectations. God was just moving in these students. And it was amazing that they were just all at the stage, all at the altar, just praying. And literally, they could have lived up there. Like, they would have been the ones in Matthew 15 where they would have been up there for three days if we let them. Just in God's presence, praying for one another, prophesying over one another. Like, literally, people were healed that night. It was just the most miraculous thing. Students were weeping, crying, getting broken from addictions, getting broken from strongholds in their life. And I remember I was sitting in the back and I'm like, I don't have anything. Like, I have nothing. Like, you know, like, typically, like, in those kinds of nights, like, I'll go on the stage and I'll start, like, I'll just get a word and I'll just start saying it, like, all that kind of stuff. Nothing. I'm just standing there like, God, where are you? Like, what's going on? And then, like, <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm dead serious this happened. Curvin, Pastor Curvin, who preached last week, who was our camp speaker, he looked at me. He was on the stage. He looked at me, and he said, come see. And I was like, me, like, on the stage, like, I don't, no, I don't have anything. And he's like, come see. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, like, I go, and I make my way to the side of the stage, Right, like kind of like by where like the, the, the stage was a little bit more round and so by where the steps were to come up. And so I'm just kind of chilling and Kervin's like, come see. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so I go on the stage. I'm like, dude, I, like I was getting ready to kind of plead my case. Like I don't have anything. <laughs> and he hands me the microphone. And he says, bro, I don't have anything. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, neither do I. And he was like, I guess we're going to just let this play out. <laughs> and we did. Like, we both got off the stage, and the students were just staying in the presence of God. They didn't need us. God was moving. You know what I mean? Yes. They didn't need any kind of word from us or anything. And so I kind of took a step back. Me and Kervin were talking, and I was just looking at everything, all of it happening. I felt like the Lord spoke to me. He said this. He said, this is what it looks like when my people come hungry, I will feed them. I will feed them. You, you want more Jesus? Be hungry for Jesus. Come wanting more of him, desiring more of him, craving more of Jesus, and you will be met with more Jesus. That's what it looks like. That's how movements start. That's how revivals happen. When God's people are hungry for him, that's it. How many of you guys have ever started like a diet and just failed miserably at it? How many of you guys? Like my hands raised. Like, uh, okay, all of you are liars. I know every single one of you probably started a diet and failed at it at some point, right? Like whether it was keto or, or paleo or Atkins back in the day, you know, like someone said way back. Who said that? <laughs> Am I old? I'm old. Oh, no. <laughs> So what, whatever diet it was that you failed at, you know, whatever it was. Uh, so I remember a few years ago when keto kind of started really taking off, I tried keto. Like I did keto. And so if you guys don't know like what keto is, basically the premise of it is that if you, uh, if you don't eat carbs, because carbs is kind of your source of energy, that if you don't eat carbs, that uh, your body will end up tapping into your fat in your body and start using that as energy because it's like stored energy. Fat is like stored energy. So you don't eat carbs, you rob yourself of carbs, and, and then you'll, your body will start eating your fat up, which is why people like, you know, get skinny and stuff. So I'm like, I'm all about it. Like I can eat bacon and stuff and like all kinds of fatty foods. I'll put butter in my coffee, you know what I mean? Like I'll do it. 
<laughs> I'll do it. So like, so here's the thing though that, uh, that's a, kind of a part of the keto diet is that for three days, your body it doesn't have carbs for energy and hasn't like taken, make, uh, done the process to start tapping into your fat. And so you feel like absolute poop for like three days. Like no energy, no nothing. Like it literally is called the keto flu because it feels like you have the flu. Like that's what it feels like. That's what it's like. So I'm like going through, you know, the three-day process of like, man, just feeling bad, like can't think straight, no energy. And so finally, like after about three days, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to feel better again. You know what I mean? I'm starting to feel good. And then, you know, like I go eat at a restaurant with someone or something like that. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to order this. And then about halfway or all the way through with my meal, I'm like, that was full of carbs. (laughs) No, I have to start all over again. And so three more days of keto flu, and then finally I'd get back into ketosis, and then guess what would happen again? (laughs) I'd eat more carbs, and then I'm like, you know what? After about three times of that, I'm like, I really don't think this diet is for me. You know what I mean? Like, like, man, I love bacon, but I just don't know if this is for me. If anyone who's like healthy in here, you guys kind of know this, uh, that like, if if you like are really a health nut and you know health, uh, anyone who, who is into health, works out and all that kind of stuff will tell you that it's not about those kind of gimmicky diets. It's about just having a healthy lifestyle change, right? It's about changing your cravings. And so the way it works is you like, man, I want a hamburger. Like, man, I could just go for a cheeseburger right now. I'm craving a cheeseburger. You decide, but I'm not going to eat that cheeseburger. I'm going to eat a, uh, a salad instead. <laughs> and so you eat the salad, and you guys know this, like you, the whole time you're eating the salad, I'm like, I just want it to taste like a cheeseburger. <laughs> I just want a cheeseburger. <laughs> Man, maybe this cheese, I could maybe picture a cheeseburger a little bit. No, it doesn't. It doesn't taste anything like a cheeseburger. And you're like miserable, right? You're like, I just want a cheeseburger. But the more times you eat salads, the more times you choose salad. At some point, it'll actually change to where you'll actually start to crave salads instead of cheeseburgers. And that you'll be like, hey, I actually kind of want a salad right now. You find the right salad for you, you know, the salad that you like. And you're like, I actually am craving a salad right now. You might still crave cheeseburgers, but you'll crave a salad. And at some point, you'll actually crave a salad more than a cheeseburger. You know, I, I, I haven't experienced that a whole lot, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. But I felt that like in, uh, like, with, like I am an avid Dr. Pepper drinker. I mean, constantly drink Dr. Pepper. I'm the guy who like goes three days of drinking straight Dr. Pepper and I'm like, oh, I feel so bad. Oh, it's because I'm dehydrated because I've drank nothing but Dr. Pepper for three days. And so, like, I'll go, you know, just kind of trying to be healthy, or maybe it's fasting or something. I'll go, like, a whole month or so without drinking Dr. Pepper. I'm like, all right, I'm cutting out sodas, right? Like, how many of you guys have ever, like, cut out sodas before, right? Like, and and you you do that for an extended period of time, and then you drink sodas again? You know what I'm talking about? Like, are those of you guys who don't drink sodas, and then you decide to drink one? It's like, why does it burn? (laughs) Like, it's so... It it feels like I'm drinking syrup. It's so sweet. It's because you've changed your craving. You've changed what you've craved. Watch what Psalm 34 says. It says this. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You want to hunger for Jesus? Taste and see that he's good. Change your cravings. Like, you may be like, man, I just don't know if I'm there. Like, how do I get there? How do I get hungry for Jesus? How do I get to the place where those students were at camp? And I want to tell you, it just takes one experience, just one time in God's presence that you'll begin to taste that he's good. And you're like, okay, I actually like this. I love this. And it's this kind of amazing dance kind of partnership that happens with you and God where he, he works in your life, he shows and reveals himself to you and then you press in. And then he reveals himself to you and then you press in and he reveals himself to you and you press in and next thing you know, you're gonna be craving 
the presence of God. You just want to sit at his feet and just be with God and never want to leave it because you know how good and how great and how amazing and how awesome he is. You know, it reminds me of this, uh, this story in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, uh, Jesus, he's on his way. There's this guy named Jairus who says, uh, he says, hey, he goes to Jesus and he says, hey, I have a 12-year-old daughter who, uh, who's dying from an illness. Can you come to my house and can you heal her? And Jesus is like, sure. And so he's on his way to Jairus' house when the Bible says that there's a crowd that pressed into him. Like they pressed in, like they're really tight around him. And, um, and so they're all really tight around him. It's like this big crowd. They're all touching him. And it says there was a woman. Oh, this is where I want to pick up. Watch in, in Luke chapter 8, verse 43, it says this. And it says, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood. So she had been bleeding out. She had a problem where she was bleeding out for 12 years. For 12 years, and she had spent all of her living, all of her life savings, all of her well-being on physicians, and she could not be healed by anyone. And so she came up behind him, talking about Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment. So there's a crowd around Jesus. She has this illness. She's been struggling with it for 12 years. She squeezes through the crowd and touches the fringe of Jesus' garment. Now, I don't know if, I'm not into fashion or anything, so I had to look up, like, what a fringe of a garment is. Like, I assumed it was a hem. Apparently, it's not. If you Google fringe garment on, on Google, you get some kind of weird stuff. Like, it's big into modeling. And so this is, like, what I pictured kind of. I found a picture that was similar to probably what it was. These are fringes, right? So he had some kind of little tassel kind of, like, piece of cloth kind of hanging off of his robes. Some people believe it was, a, it was a belt tied around his waist with little fringes, with little fringes on it. So this is just literally a little piece of cloth that is attached just barely to his robe, to his garment that was dangling, that she touched. She touched the fringe, a fringe off of his garment, a little piece of cloth off of his garment, and watch what it says. It says, and immediately her, her discharge of blood ceased. <clears throat> and Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And I absolutely loved Peter's reply because it would have been my reply, super smart aleck. Yeah. She said, when, when all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowd's surrounding you and pressing in on you. <laughs> like Peter's like, Jesus, I don't know if you know this but you got like 20 people touching you. <laughs> He's like, you know, I could see him all puffed chest like, Jesus. <laughs> um, but he says, but Jesus replies, watch this. He says, but Jesus said, someone touched me for I perceived that power has come from me. That yes, there's maybe 20, 30 people touching me right now crowded in, but this touch, this touch is different. This touch, this touch is from someone who's desperate. This touch, this touch is from someone who is hungry for me. This touch, this touch is from someone who just touches my garment because she knew that just one touch from my garment could change everything for her. That, that, that one moment with Jesus can change everything. Like everything, like everything, like the game is different when Jesus is on the field. Like logic and rules are out the window. Jesus' presence, otherworldly, other, uh, unnatural, not of this world presence changes everything. And so she had a desperation, a hunger, a desire that she just wanted one touch from Jesus because she knew it would change her life. All of the money that she gave to physicians, one touch from a fringe of his garment healed her in an instant. One moment with Jesus changed her forever. And I know that some of you in here, you're like, well, I mean, of course, like, that's, that's, that's me. Like, Jesus was right here in the flesh, walking to the back. Like, of course, 
Of course I'd want to just touch the fringe of his garment. Just, just one little, you know, like, I would try, we would all press in on him. I could picture it right now, like if Jesus, creator of the universe, savior of humanity, appeared physically right here, we would press in too. And we would all just try to get a moment with Jesus. And so we could all say that and think that and know that. Like, I mean, if I saw Jesus walking, I'd do the same thing. But I want to remind you of something. Well, I want to, well I'll ask you one question. But how will, you, how will your touch be? Will it be with hunger, with desperation? Or will it be just like the rest of the crowd, just pressing in on him? But I want to remind you of something. In, in John chapter 16, this is Jesus talking. And he says, nevertheless, it is to your advantage that I go away. It is to your advantage that I leave you. For if I do not go away, the helper or the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It is to your advantage that I leave. It is to your advantage because when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Why why is that to our advantage? I'll tell you why. Because God's power was limited to his kind of physical location when Jesus was walking the earth, right? Like, it took people pressing in, touching a fringe of his garment in order to be healed, in order to be in the presence of God, in order for, to just walk with God. They had to physically walk with God. Jesus is saying, it's to your advantage that I leave, because when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, which is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere, which means his power is everywhere, that God's presence is everywhere, which means you don't have to wait to a physical Jesus to touch the fringe of his garment. It's right there hanging in front of you right now. Like right now, you can touch the fringe of his garment and everything be different. Everything be changed. That wherever you go, wherever you're doing, you can have a moment with Jesus where you touch the fringe of Jesus' garment and everything be different. You know, back in the Old Testament, they had altars, right? Altars where they would go and they would sacrifice animals and they had to sacrifice animals in order to, uh, to be forgiven of their sins and be in commune with God or to be with God. And it was oftentimes, you know, like a lamb that they would slay the lamb on the altar to be forgiven and to be with God. And how many of you guys know that when Jesus died, he was the ultimate lamb, that he was slain on the altar, and his blood covered the multitude, everyone's sins, all of our sins. And so we get to live in the omnipresent, everywhere power of God. Is your life falling apart? Is your spiritual life falling apart? Can I tell you, it's probably because you left the altar. Yes, that's good. It's because you left the altar. Your marriage is falling apart? Go to the altar. That your, your kids are being disobedient or completely left you and, and are going down paths you don't want them to go. Go to the altar. Your work is getting hard. Go to the altar. Your family is difficult. Go to the altar. Wherever you need Jesus to be, he can meet you right there. The altar is everywhere. It's everywhere. I love, uh, so, you know, like I said, I talked about Camp Youth last week. Uh, that happened last week, just a few days after that, I get this text from one of our youth students. Uh, she texts me and this kind of like what is going on and like how she's kind of responding to camp and I had to tell you guys about this because it's amazing. Watch what she says. She said, walking into my room, I knew I needed to make it my war room. So I dropped my bags, fell to my knees and worshiped. After watching the God, the way God worked within not only me, but all of the young people, I knew I couldn't come home and live the same life I was living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I knew it had to be different. 
you know, part of it that I didn't include in this, that she says, like, I saw, the, I saw my city different coming back. Everything looked different now. And so she walks into her room. I can imagine the place that, that, that the, the enemy just roamed the most, the place that, that the enemy spoke the most lies to her, the place that she felt the most insecure, the place that maybe she's fallen in a few different ways, just did things that she knew she shouldn't do, that place just alone in her bedroom where maybe she felt the most lonely. She said, you know what? The same God as at, that is at camp is the same God that can be here right now. And so I'm gonna drop my bags. I'm gonna get to my knees. And this area of my life where the enemy is roaming the most, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna set up an altar for him. That I'm gonna just be in his presence. I'm just gonna like sit in his presence. I'm gonna turn it into my war room. What the enemy meant for evil, that God is turning for good in her life. Can I tell you something? Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. He's worth all of it. He, he doesn't want much. He just wants everything. Which isn't much compared to him and who he is and what we get in return. That you might think I have so much to give up. That I have all this stuff and I can't give it to God like it's just been my idol for too long, like I've been looking for money, I've been desiring money for too long and I just, that's my hunger, that's my craving. That maybe my, your kids, your kids have been that for you, that you just like, they're, they're just my everything, they're my reason for living, they're my reason for breathing. Maybe it's your career, like you finally got your career job. Earlier, those things let you down, continuously let you down because they're not meant to be in that position. So what you do is you set up an altar in those places. You go to the altar in those places. You go into the presence of God. You touch the fringe of garment that is on Jesus in those areas of life that you feel that the enemy is just roaming freely. And so can we do this? I just wanna do this, this is a little bit different. Maybe with every head bowed and eyes closed, just no looking around, because this is, this is gonna be a personal moment. Personal moment that we just, just between us and God. If you're in here, and you just feel like, man, I've just struggled with this, putting this kind of area of my life, this person, this thing, first in my life for too long, it's continuously let me down. And I just need Jesus to be there. Can we do this? Can we just, can we just lift our hands right now? Hands open wide, open wide. It's just, this, it's just the symbolism that we're handing it over to Jesus right now, that it's his. He could do with it what he wants. The, our children are yours, God. Our spouse, it's yours, God. They're yours, God. We give them to you, Jesus. We know that you don't want our giftedness. You just want our giveness. We don't, we can't give much to you, but we know that we're, we just wanna give our lives to you right now, in this moment. We give it to you. So you can put your hands down. Maybe you're in here and you feel like, man, I, I'm, I don't think I've ever had Jesus as first in my life. Like, I've, I don't think I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I didn't realize how great he is, how majestic he is, how awesome he is, how beautiful he is, the perfection of beauty. That one moment could change my life around with him. I didn't know that until I walked in here today. If that's you and you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time today, can you just lift your hands, no looking around? Just lift your hands right now, okay, okay. It's amazing. 
God, you are so merciful. God, you're so gracious. That though we may lack and have continuously put things as idols in our lives, put things before you, we know that we are just met with more grace, more mercy, more kindness. Help us, God, to see you for who you are, which is perfect, which is the answer that we are looking for, the peace that we're desiring, the joy we're desiring. Just thank you for your presence. Thank you for your redeeming presence. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.